All right. In this video, I want to talk about interpretation. Now, I've made videos about it before, but I wanted to have this up to show the dictionary definition of interpretation. And just make the point here that interpretation is basically, as it says here, an exegesis, which is an explanation, uh, trying to expound and explain something like a translation or a prophecy or what have you, right? Something that seems to be obscure and hard to grasp. And interpretation is how you understand it and how you grasp it, right? So uh, the problem is, is that people have turned interpretation into just basically opinion is basically what it is because like you you show something like scripture right and somebody will say oh that's your interpretation well then you can just use the same thing back on them when they try to show you something be oh that's just your interpretation so basically you're saying oh that's your opinion this is my opinion all right there's no reason to put your opinion above mine and there's no reason for you to put my opinion above yours right so what needs to be made clear are the facts right and the facts are when it comes to interpretation of the bible is first things first as you interpret it the same way you would interpret reading any other book or how you would interpret listening to somebody talk. You take them as they are. You you take it for what it says, and that's that, right? If somebody says, oh, I'm going to go to the store, I'll be back in 15 minutes, there's no reason to take it any other way than that. When God says, don't eat from the tree the knowledge of good and evil, there's no reason to take it anything... Or to mean anything other than what it means. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? It's when they started to play around with it and do this quote unquote interpretation of what God said that they got all jacked up. So the first thing you need to do is take it for what it says because that's what got messed up in the Garden of Eden. They didn't take God for what he said. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Day that you do, you'll die. And the serpent comes along. Well, didn't God say you could eat from every tree? Conveniently leaving out a piece of God's word there about not eating from this certain tree. And then Eve says something that actually adds to what God said. Oh, you can't even touch it or you'll die. Well, that's not what God said. Right? So that got her all uh, jacked up and got her deceived, right? So the first thing we need to do is just take God's word as it says, right? The second thing is, is the same thing you would do when you're, like I said, reading another book, talking to somebody, or in contract law. Whoever wrote the contract is the one that explains it. Right. So if somebody tells you something and you go, oh, well, I thought they meant this, that and the other thing. And they tell you, no, this is what I meant. I said it pretty clearly. If you had any questions, you could have asked me. There's no reason for you to go and jump to something else and think. Whatever it is you thought, that was not what I said. Right. Like here in the contract. Oh, I thought it meant this. Well, I'm the one that wrote it. You signed it. So it actually goes by my interpretation and how I explain it. Not how you do. Right? So with the Bible, that's the next thing is that God interprets himself. So if you read something and you don't understand it, you don't know what's going on, you don't just make up what you want. You need to be able to back it up with other scriptures 
right? So when you read, like in, uh, for an example, in Genesis, that after Adam and Eve fell, God clothed them by sacrificing an animal to clothe them. But it doesn't say what the animal was. Well, you can speculate, was it a bear, a lion? What was it? Well, later on in the scriptures, you read about Jesus being the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So right there, you can pair that with the sacrificial uh, sacrificial law that was given to Israel. And you see, oh, it's the lamb of God. That's what was slain to clothe Adam and Eve. Right? So that's the second thing is letting whoever wrote it interpret themselves. Just like when we're talking to one another, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you don't just go make up what I said and what I really mean. Oh, oh, oh this guy, he, he said this and this and this is what he means. No, you have no authority to say that. Nobody does. I have the authority to explain myself. So it's the same thing with the Word of God. It's the same thing with contract law. That's also another thing that has to do with law is that it's also in the scriptures as it is with uh, legalese as well is that uh, the law of threes where in the scriptures you need two or three witnesses to establish a fact, to establish a word, right? So if you take one passage of scripture that seems to be saying a certain something, right? So you interpret it to mean, let's just say something weird and outlandish, like, oh, see, this passage says that I'm God, right? Well, you need at least one more passage to verify that that's what is being said. As it is with law, if you said something, like in court, it can be dismissed because you said it once. Maybe it was just something you said in passing. Maybe you didn't quite mean what exactly you said uh, in the context. Uh, maybe you have to explain that. But then if you say it again, it's kind of like, okay, that's something to pay attention to, but it's not solidified yet. But okay, there's something to it. And as soon as you say it three or more times, it's established, okay, this person means exactly what they're saying. This is what's going on. And even Jesus used that when he said, hey, you don't just got to listen to me because of the works I'm doing here. Look at the witnesses. I have John the Baptist witnessed of me. Uh, my father from heaven witnessed of me. The Holy Spirit descending upon me witnessed of me. And the scriptures themselves witness of me. Right? So he was showing his works. John the Baptist, his father, the Holy Spirit, and the scriptures. He was showing five witnesses to verify who he was. And that's in uh, John chapter 5 and a little bit at the end of John chapter 7 as well, using the scriptures to verify who Jesus was. Having witnesses, right? Because many people claim to be the Messiah. So you need to be able to prove it. And Jesus was able to back that up. Uh, so when you're you're coming to the scriptures and you're starting to look at things and you're explaining things, well then you need to have all those boxes checked. And as an example, in Matthew, you know what, let's just bring it up and take a look at it ourselves here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16 here. Because there's a couple of other things that you need to do when interpreting. Right? Let's go over to Matthew and let's go to chapter 16, right? And uh, we got here Peter's confession here. Uh, so first things first. Uh, basics in English is the first sentence of the paragraph is the subject of the paragraph. So what is the first sentence of this paragraph? When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, 
he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? All right, so right there, the context of this paragraph is who Jesus is. Right? Right there. So when we're reading this, we need to read this in the context of this talking about who Jesus is. Right? It goes on to say, And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He, say, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? So now he's asking them, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now this is the key of the paragraph here because it was about who he is and this is where it's revealing who he is he's the Christ he's the Messiah the son of the living God and Jesus answered and said unto him blessed art thou Simon Barjona for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee but my father which is in heaven and I say unto thee that thou art Peter so here he goes from Simon he's calling him Peter which means a rock. Or as John says in John chapter 1, he calls him Cephas. He calls him Peter, which is interpreted a stone. And when you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter refers to himself as a stone. Right? So he's being called a stone. And then it says, Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? So, Simon is being called a stone. And it says, upon this rock, I will build my church. But what Jesus is talking about is what Peter confessed. Peter confessed who Jesus was. And Jesus says that flesh and blood did not reveal this to him. And then he says to, Pete, to Simon, you are Peter, you're a stone. And upon this rock, I will build my church. The rock is not Peter. These are two different words. That's why they're translated differently. This is Petros, which is a stone. Or in the Aramaic is Cephas. And then over here, rock is Petra. It's a different word. He's not saying thou art the rock and upon this rock I'll build my church. He's saying no, you are a stone and upon your confession I'm of who I am, I'm going to build my church. All right? And that would be the proper way to see this. Yet. The Catholic Church takes this to say that Peter is the rock that the church is built upon, right? And it's like, okay, let's say that's how it is. Okay, you got one witness. Where's at least one more witness to verify this? Search the scriptures. Search through the New Testament. That is never, ever said of Peter, that he is the foundation of or that he's the head of the church, that he's the vicar of Christ, he's the bishop of bishops, the pope. There's nothing like that even implied about Peter. So you don't have any other witness. Right? So when we read the rest of this, this is something that is being said to the church, not to Peter alone. Right? Because he says upon... This rock, I'll build my church. So upon the fact that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'll build my church. And he says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever shall thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Right? So this actually goes for the entire church. And we actually see an example of this. When we go to Acts chapter 10. We can see how Peter was used to open the door up to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles can come into the kingdom of God. Right? Because that's what keys do. And then near the end of Acts, we have Paul closing the door on the Jews, saying, All right, from henceforth, I'm no more dealing with you, I'm going to the Gentiles alone. Right, I think he says that a couple times in the last few chapters of Acts. And it's like one of the last things that is actually mentioned in Acts, like Acts 26. 
I was like, all right, closing the door to you, we're going to the Gentiles. So we see that it wasn't just Peter who had this, these keys here, right? And then how does the this whole thing end? He says, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So, again, the whole context, the whole foundation is who Jesus is. And we can actually have witnesses to this, right? So let's uh, let's go into that. Let's actually open up a couple more tabs here. Let's just do a copy over here to make it quick to get to. I wasn't planning on doing this. I was just planning on talking about interpretation. But you know, let's just play it out and show how it works. So let's come over here to Peter, right? Because Peter, he's supposed to be the foundation of the church, right? Well, let's look at what Peter says. He says at verse 4 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter, To whom coming as unto a, a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also are lively stones. Right? He calls us all stones just like he is called in uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 1. Are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So we're, all of us are lively stones like Peter, a holy priesthood. Right? Let's continue on here. He talks about the chief cornerstone and about believing on the cornerstone right here in Jesus Christ. And then uh, he talks about those who are disobedient and didn't believe. But he's become the head of the corner. So he's talking about Jesus being the foundation stone. And then he says here that Jesus is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, wherein to, to also they were appointed. And this word here for rock is never used for Peter. This is Petra. The same word here. Petra, which is the foundation. So Peter calls Jesus the foundation of offense. He's the foundation of the church. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the head of the corner. Never says anything about him having any place whatsoever. Not only that. Let's get a third witness. Let's get a third witness to verify my interpretation so that this is not just something. Wait, I think it's actually 1 Corinthians. This is not just something taking one verse out of context or one passage out of context. Let's, let's follow the rules, right? We follow what it plainly says, which we already did in English, took it into context. Now we're going to use... Three witnesses. First Corinthians chapter 3, at verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and other man buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that, that, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then he talks about us building upon Jesus. No mention of Peter. No mention of a bishop of bishops. A prime minister a pope, nothing like that. He just says, Jesus, and you build upon him. He's like, I lay down the foundation of Jesus. You start building on him. You believe that gospel. You're part of the church. You're a lively stone. You're built up on Jesus. Right? So, that's how it's done. That's how you interpret, you explain, right? And by this definition, that's how it's done, right? Uh, we even have the Bible telling us this in Isaiah 
I believe it is it's talking about how you're to study is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Right? That's how you are actually to study. Like, the Bible is a lot of things, and one of the things it is, is a marriage contract. And you as the church are part of the bride, so you might want to go over the contract, right? And use contract law, where whoever wrote the contract interprets the contract. And where there's two or three witnesses to establish something, then you can really solidify that and rely on that. But if you find one verse, one passage that seems to fit what you're trying to say, but no other witnesses, that is not something you can actually build upon. Right? Uh, another passage that would be used would be uh, John chapter 20, I believe it is, where the Catholics would say, oh, see, Jesus gave the apostles, the authority to forgive sins. I say, okay, okay. Uh, need two or three witnesses. So, all right, back that up. Is that really what's being said? Or isn't it? Because when we go to 1 John, we see that John says that Jesus Christ forgives us our sins and washes us in his blood in 1 John chapter 1. And then as it goes into chapter 2, he continues that thought saying, hey, if you sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins. So John, who wrote the Gospel of John, wrote a small letter, First John, explaining that it is Jesus that we go to to confess our sins. It's Jesus that forgives us with his own blood by his sacrifice. So you have a contradicting, contradicting view of John himself with that passage that Catholics like to use from John chapter, I believe it's 20, where Jesus says something about whoever sins, um, ye remit, they are remitted, and whoever sins, ye retain, they are retained. And the Catholics take that and interpret it to mean, oh, they have the authority to forgive you or not, so you have to do what the priests say, or they're not going to forgive you, right? But that's bad interpretation, that's bad exegesis, that's bad explanation, because why does John contradict that in one of his smaller letters? Where's the two or three witnesses to establish that fact? Why is it on all these times you establishing a doctrine you're establishing it on one verse, one passage, and have nothing else to support it. That's exactly what cults do. They'll come to the Bible, they'll look at one passage or one verse from here, and they will build a whole belief system out of it and then establish a whole new church. And the Catholic Church is guilty of the same thing. They took this one passage here, and they've built the whole doctrine to, to establish their church, which comes into a contradiction because they'll end up saying, oh, you see, this gives us the authority. And then, okay, oh, so the Bible has the authority because that's where you establish your authority? No, 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 the Pope gave the Bible the authority by claiming that the Bible is the Word of God. It's like, but the Bible gave you the authority to do that. Yep. So it's like, well, you got the circular reason. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, the Bible or the Pope? You know, which one got the authority first? Which one gave authority to who? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. But good luck telling that to a Catholic because they'll just say, well, that's your interpretation. So if you're going to bother talking with these people, just talk to them about interpretation. Be like, well, that's your interpretation. Right? Because that's the same game they like to play with you, right? Who who gave you the authority to, to interpret? Well, who gave it to you? Right? They they want to try to say, oh, the, the Pope has the authority. Well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> right? You want to play these games. We're not going to be reasonable people and come to logical conclusions based on the facts. 
then okay, we play games if we even talk at all, right? So that being said, thanks for watching and take care.